Good morning. I greet you most warmly and welcome to another edition of Good Morning Southern Territory. My name is Major Ray Begley and my very special guest this morning is Major Daryl Croden, just back from New Zealand. But before we speak to Daryl, just let me tell you this. From Moscow to Melbourne, from New York to Nigeria, the Salvation Army proclaims the message of Jesus Christ in over 120 countries around the world. And one of the elements of the Salvation Army's work uh, a developing and continuing uh, service within the Salvation Army is international emergency, which Daryl has had a great deal to do with. Just list, if you can remember, some of the nations in which you have either visited or served, in, in, in especially uh, international emergency. Um, it started in Sri Lanka uh -huh. for me. And then was that the tsunami? That was the tsunami in yep. 2004 and five. Then Rwanda and India, Philippines, Taiwan, uh, Mongolia and New Zealand. Okay. Now, I've been involved with international emergency with you in different nations. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was on the very first team 21 years ago to be sent to Kuwait and Saudi Arabia for the Gulf War. So it really started 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really involved with kind of making soup and handing out blankets. You're, you're in at a, a kind of management level. So just explain how that works in relationship to the Salvation Army internationally. Well, the, the, my main role has been in implementing teams and working out ways in which the IES, the IHQ people... IES stands for? The International Emergency Service Thank you. people okay. from London and how we can work with local territories. So we sometimes bring in teams varying sizes, but specialists usually, and then we work with the territory that we're in to work out how we can deliver a program or projects right. in a way that are culturally unrelevant to the, the territory that we're in. Now, you yeah. went to Haiti yes. and you served in Haiti for a few weeks or months. Yeah. Mm. Just tell us some of the experience of Haiti because the, the earthquake in Haiti was enormous and, and the kind of cleanup process and so on. So just talk yeah. to us about that. Oh, Haiti, of course, was a mess before the earthquake. Yes, indeed. Um, I arrived in Haiti about six months, almost to the day after the earthquake. So there'd been a number of teams up until that time and the, and the projects were in place. Right. So when I arrived, it was a matter of uh, managing things like the medical, the medical uh, teams, the rebuilding teams, and the um, management of a IDP camp, an internally displaced peoples okay. camp. So next door to the Salvation Army, or what was the Salvation Army, there was 20,000 people on the soccer field and we were managing, or our team was managing that, that camp, which was the second largest in Haiti at the time. So it was a bit like a tent city yeah. in which the Salvation Army managed. Yes. Yeah. So were there medical services and feeding programs and all of those within the, that There setup? wasn't when I got there. In the early days when they set it up, there was, very, they were, there was medical teams and feeding going on. By the time I arrived, the people themselves had started their own shops in yes, the tent city. Sure. We had a clinic next door in which, to which we uh, referred people from the camp. But most of our stuff was just, we had we developed a committee from the camp, right. a management committee, and we with them managed that kind of stuff. We did still do distributions. Like when I was there, we distributed over... Um, um, about three tonnes of baby food one day. Goodness. We distributed two cots to every family, which was about uh, 12,000 families. And we distributed uh, some other food as well on three different days. Right. And for those things, we had to work with uh, the Brazilian military. We had to... I would imagine crowd them. control is a bit of a problem in those... It was horrible. Yes, I'm um, sure. One of our events, we actually had to stop it because the the uh, protection, the security was a major issue and the Brazilian military um, asked us to stop and we were herded into military vehicles and got out quick Goodness. because things went quite bad on one of those occasions. Over the years, one of the two things I've really noticed is that human dignity uh, needs to be respected and people need to be given respect for even if they're in the most dire circumstances. Mm. And the other thing I've noticed, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this, is how resilient the human spirit is, even in the most extraordinary mm. disaster. People still rise up and they still laugh and their, their sense of humour. Have yeah. you witnessed all of that? Oh, very much. And in Haiti, I, I saw that a lot. Um, 
the people were a very generous people too, despite the fact that many of the people we were dealing with were living in corrugated iron sheds. Sure. If we came, they wanted to give us a drink or they wanted to give us food. In Sri Lanka, in the very first days after the tsunami, I saw a lot of people walking around like zombies. Yes. yes. But as soon as they started to see people doing little bits and pieces like cleaning up a block of land, uh -huh. or they got in alongside us and it was like a kickstart to the stuff you're talking about. Right. And and people just got in alongside each other and were supporting each other and supporting us in, yes. in what we were doing too. Tell us a little bit about New Zealand. You've just returned from Christchurch yeah. and uh, I know it's almost three and a half months down the track now since yeah. the earthquake, but just tell us what the Salvation Army's response and, and how things are in Christchurch. Well, we were the first church-based and uh, international NGO, if, there, if we can be classified as that, on the scene on the day on February 22nd. By four o'clock, the earthquake was at 12 o'clock. By four o'clock that afternoon, we were feeding people in the first, what they call welfare centres. Goodness. On the, in Hagley Park. And that welfare centre developed in the matter of hours into a thousand people. And we were feeding people from that first dinner, if you like, right. for about three weeks. And then in eight other welfare centres like that, so our immediate was resp response was very much like we're used to here in Australia. It was food yes. and it was drinks. But after that, then we started to get involved in some other kinds of projects, including cleaning up houses. We joined with the local council in a thing that they called Operation Suburb. And in the first 10 days, with a number of other agencies, we knocked on 70,000 houses. My goodness. And that was a rapid assessment. So it was really just a knock on the door are you alive? Are you well? Do you have food? Sure. Do you have water? If you haven't got food and water, we rang up our local Salvation Army centres and food and water was delivered within 24 hours. Right. And we maintained that for, well, for the eight weeks that I was there, we were maintaining that. And within a 24, 48-hour time period, we were delivering food and water to places and people that didn't have it. And that was the major aspect of our work. Right. We've come to the last question. I'm sorry. That's right. We could speak to you all afternoon or morning. Um, how has this affected you and your development as a Salvation Army officer? What has it done to you personally? I know you're out there helping, but, you know, your own personal development, what has happened with that? I guess it's developed on who I think I was brought up to be. My parents brought me up in a third world country right. in, in poverty, uh, in a poverty situation. So this kind of stuff, I guess, has enabled me to find out how I can actually make a difference for those people. Not, not that it's a, not a big thing, but not just sit back in Australia and give to Osams or pray, but how I can intentionally and practically land on the ground in a country and make a difference in a person's and a community's life. Right. And the Salvation Army have given me the tools to be able to do that. And we've seen some amazing things happen as a result. In Rwanda, one of the places we started had a core of 200 people 12 months later. And it's an amazing transformational experience. And now the Salvation Army in Rwanda is booming. Huge. It's incredible. It's great. Well, listen, we want to say thank you for coming in and talking to us. God bless you. Thank you. And uh, it's been good talking to you. We want you to sit back and watch the clip we're going to show you about Salvation Army International work, and then I'm going to be interviewing Major John Farquharson. Stick with us. See you soon.
Welcome back to Good Morning Southern Territory. My name is Ray Begley and I'm delighted to introduce my second special guest today, Major John Farquharson, who is really, we work together yeah, in the core sure program department. Yep. John, uh, it's a pleasure, Ray. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. You've had a heart for Africa and the International Army for years, haven't you? I have, Ray. Uh, it's sort of something that really started oh, a long time ago. Right. Um, and I've had various opportunities, but it's also part of the sort of love of cultural diversity that yes. I that just sort of is part of who I am, I guess. Um, T tell us where you've served. What, what nations have you served look, and what kind of work have you done? Look, primarily in Zimbabwe and Zambia, uh -huh. and it's been related to the Officer Training College. Um, I also had done some work in evaluation and community development uh, in, in studies, and so had been in Bangladesh and the Philippines and Indonesia right, okay. and Papua New Guinea. So they were sort of um, some of the areas, but they were short-term sort of projects. Sure. But mm. particularly in Zimbabwe and Zambia. And particularly in Zimbabwe and Zambia. Okay. The Salvation Army in Africa is booming. I mean, it really is. Yeah. There are more yep. Salvationists in Africa than all the world put together. That's yes, correct, isn't that's it? That's right. Yep. What is it about the Salvation Army in Africa that, that catches the Africans' attention? Is it our uniform? Is it the... What is it, do you think? Look, I think uniform is really important because uniform and status that's a, a, a associated with uniform is really important. Um, but it's it's sort of almost the dignity we attribute to people. Right. Um, th th there is something that we respect culture and yet bring other bring our own sort of dynamic to it. And there's something passionate and exciting about the Salvation Army. Like mission yes. is, is critical, and 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 the African folk just love to have a, a purpose, yes. and and so it really does generate that enthusiasm among our. Uh, well, our recruits and, and yes. soldiers who just love getting into mission. <laughs> they they still have things very strongly like Home League and League of Mercy yep. and yep. some of the things that we in the Western world have almost dropped off. They hold on to very tightly and consider it a real honour to be a Home League member. Or yeah, And Home League is one of the more exciting programmes. It's really quite... Uh, really? Uh, uh, where many of the social work of the Salvation Army takes place through the work of women yes. in, and the Home League is a really important part of that, sort of um, where they will run um, income generating projects, they'll run sort of, uh, I guess, you know, the micro credit schemes and right. all of those things are, are run through the women's ministries and, and Home League. Uh, community care is another exciting one where people can show real care for people in their village and community setting. Yes. Um, my heart was first moved when I observed some HIV AIDS work uh, in Zimbabwe in some of the rural areas where it was the core members who went out and provided home-based care, you know, because the hospitals just couldn't cope with yes, the number of, of people. Yes. And to see some of those soldiers in action in very difficult cir circumstances, yes. I could understand that here they were bringing the love of God in a very concrete and real way and demonstrating what it means to be a Salvationist. Right. Yeah. Now, two key areas of ministry that the Salvation Army have developed in Africa is education yep. and medical care. That's right. Mm. So, when you know in Zimbabwe, there are the incredible boarding houses or boarding schools mm. that we, we and, and of a very high standard. Yep. Just talk to us about Chicken Carter, which is one of the most famous Salvation Army mm. hospitals in the world. But you've just returned from Zambia. Yeah. Just give us an overview of what Chicken Carter is like. What does it look like? Where is it? Those kind of things. Look, Chicken Carter is in the southwest, southern part of Zambia. It's uh, in a rural area. It's probably about 50k from the nearest major uh, city, which is Mazabuka. Gosh, okay. Um, it services the Tonga-speaking people. And they were the people who were displaced when the uh, Zambezi was flooded to create Carib Kariba Dam. And so the whole area of um, Chicken Kata and surrounds being very rural, slightly mountainous right. and hilly, uh, is one which of people who've been settled, you know, primarily in the last sort of 40 years. Um, Chicken Kata was established about 47 years ago as a mission to those people and the hospital was one of the very first things. Right. And, and in the hospital, it's a combination of primary health care and sort of a variety of wards that sort of take care of, um, I, we're talking about 100,000 people are serviced by the hospital. Goodness. So it's quite a... Mm. So within the Chicken Carter compound, mm -hmm. there is a core? There's a core. 
Uh, actually, there are two core. Two uh, cores, yes. right? Okay. Uh, there are there's a a secondary school, uh -huh. and then there are two um, accredited university type colleges, which is the biomedical college and the nursing college. Then there is the hospital, and then there are a range of community development projects and um, and primary healthcare outreach programs. So. It's a quite an amazing complex of buildings yes. and sort of uh, programs and facilities that operate out of there. And what was your job? When you went out just a few months ago for a three or four month period, you went specifically for what reason? It was the, it was the as hospital administrator. Okay. Um, there was a, a temporary shortfall and it needed someone to connect, you know, uh, the two, uh, the departure of a previous hospital administrator with the arrival of a new hospital administrator. And having had some experience in Zambia, right. um, that was why I was recruited for that position. Um, and it was an exciting time, yes. uh, a wonderful time meeting and being with uh, great people and uh, just seeing some great programs too. The Salvation Army officers that I've met around the world who have served in Africa, they tell me that Africa gets into your blood. And once you've served there, you're... you're your heart or part of your heart belongs to Africa. Is that true? Always true. Always <laughs> true. <laughs> always right. true for everyone. And you're always kind of slightly <laughs> longing to go back. And... Always wanting to go back. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's really quite interesting that um, on Saturday night, in a dream period during the night, all I was dreaming about was being at Chicken Carter. <laughs> <laughs> and then you woke up and realised you're at THQ <laughs> in Melbourne. <laughs> yes. Well, listen, we want to say thank you yeah. and God bless you and thank yeah. you for your experience and your service to God. We're most grateful. Thank you, Rad. Can I just remind you that if you want to look at our website, it's www.facebook.com forward slash Leadership, or even check out the TC's blog, which is tctoday.net. Thank you very much for joining us on this Good Morning Southern Territory. May God bless you.